Good morning. We are going to give the second lecture on developmental neuroscience today. The first one was lecture three. Ralph Adolphs did a marvelous job of providing you with an overview. Uh, now that you have a little more experience thinking about molecules in neuroscience, and now that the excitement associated with the Nobel Prize has um, decreased a bit, uh, I put together this second lecture on developmental neuroscience, molecules and mechanisms. And uh, let's go over then the first uh, set of principles that Ralph Adolphs gave you during uh, lecture three. And uh, some of the principles actually derived from the introductory chapters of Kandel. Uh, then he also showed you real human brains during discussion sections, which was as fascinating to me as it was to you. Uh, and then began some of the material in chapters 52 and 53. So now let's continue and emphasize these additional points from Kandel. Uh, the chapters are very nicely organized by major headings, which are declarative statements in blue. And uh, I expect you to be familiar with those declarative statements and to be able to find one example of each declarative statement, uh, with the exception uh, that we don't talk about the differences between axons and dendrites. So, and also in later lectures, we're going to talk about this nifty topic that the development of visual perception requires visual experience and uh, we will not discuss sexual differentiation of the nervous system at all, just because we don't have time. Uh, we will certainly talk about repairing the damaged brain in later lectures, and we will certainly talk about the aging brain, mostly in the context of neurodegenerative diseases in later lectures. But for today, I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of these four chapters in Candell. Uh, so going back to this very interesting theme of the Hox genes and homeotic mutations, uh, this word homeotic means a mutation that transforms one body part into another. So here, for instance, is a cross section of the hind brain of a mouse. There are a total of actually eight segmental units. Uh, these are the bulges of the developing neural tube within the hindbrain region during development. Now, in a wild-type mouse, um, in a wild-type mouse, oops, um, we have each of the rhombomeres one of the eight units, uh, projecting outside the brain, in, in this case, the, uh, to the trigeminal nerve and the facial nerve. The rhombomeres are numbered one through eight. A Hox1b mutant mouse uh, has an interruption in the Hox, sorry, B1 gene. And, uh, you, Ralph told you, and I will emphasize today, that we have distinct ways of describing genes, which have really developed historically. Uh, if the gene is in a fly, it's all lowercase. If it's in a mouse, it has it is capitalized, the first letter. And if it's in a human, all letters are capitalized. That's the way things have grown up, and you can't change this. Well, I don't have the energy to change this. So, what does a Hox1b mutant mouse mean? It means there's been an interruption in the Hox1b gene, less Hox1b protein. The result of that mutation, less Hox1b protein, is that in a rhombomere, where Hox1b is strongly expressed in the wild type, it is not strongly expressed in the mutant. And the result is that the default pattern for this 
rhombomere number four is that it has a pattern very similar to that of rhombomere number two. It sends its axons to and from the trigeminal nucleus. So a homeotic mutation transforms one body part into another. That's why I did, that's the definition of a homeotic mutation. We should point out that homeotic is a general statement for phenotype. That is the phenomenon that results from a genotype. So that phenotype is homeotic. The genotype is a mutation in the Hox B1 gene. For those of you who have not yet taken by 120, by 122. Uh, of course, the facial, the uh, cranial nerves have been named for hundreds of years. Some, uh, and there are various mnemonics, mnemonics for how to remember those cranial nerves. Most of these mnemonics are scatological, and you can read some of those scatological mnemonics here in Wikipedia. The olfactory, et cetera, down to the twelfth um, nerve, which is, I believe, hypoglossal. No, twelfth nerve. I'm not sure what it is. Anyway, you can read, and you don't need to memorize this. It's for your own edification. But if you're going to go to medical school, you'll have to learn this sooner or later. So a rhombomere is one of the segmental units. You could also call it a bulge. The reason that a rhombomere forms, the reason that the bulge forms, is that the neurons in the center of the rhombomere proliferate a bit faster than the ones at the edges, so it bulges out. So these are homeotic mutations, uh, and the, the genes have these names. And let's go on to analyze the homeotic gene and Hox gene a little more. Uh, a little bit of terminology. Most homeotic mutations, that is transformation of one body part to another, occur in genes which are transcription factors. A transcription factor is a gene whose gene product, the protein, controls the expression of another gene, typically by binding to DNA. So all transcription factors are DNA binding proteins. Uh, the, all, uh, all Hox genes contain a homeodomain, which is in the protein, and it's a type of DNA binding protein domain. And naturally, all homeodomains are found in transcription factors because transcription factors are by far the largest number of proteins that bind to DNA, although some of the um, chromatin uh, proteins do as well. So Hox genes have DNA sequences in them called homeoboxes, which encode homeodomains. So we have Hox genes, we have homeotic mutations, homeoboxes, and homeodomains. And evidently, the H in Hox gene comes from homeotic mutation. Uh, Candell and many other books show you details of a slide that Ralph Adolphs have, has always shown you on regionalization of the nervous system uh, in Drosophila, fruit flies, and in mammals. So there are Hox genes, depending on how you spell them, both among invertebrates and among all known vertebrates. Uh, it, among vertebrates, there are actually four clusters of Hox genes. In mice, they are on different chromosomes. Presumably, chromosomes arose by duplicating each other many times, uh, often in um, vertebrate genes. So this is like uh, a figure in Candell. The Hox genes then control the identity of segments, rhombomeres, in the hindbrain. Interestingly enough, uh, this in, in the Drosophila, the antennapedia complex is uh, among the Hox genes. There's also the bithorax complex discovered here at Caltech by Ed Lewis. Okay, now, here's a tough one for today. Which body part do you think is duplicated in bithorax? Uh, 
Nobody wants to has, has, hazard that one. Yes, it's the thorax. Okay. Uh, so the, the mutation in the bithorax gene produces two copies of the thorax. Um, and of course, the Hox genes encode transcription factors which bind to DNA and have homeoboxes that participate in the binding to DNA. And the Hox gene expression along the anterior-posterior axis determines cell fate. And furthermore, Hox gene expression along the body is collinear with the Hox gene order along the chromosome. So at the three prime end of this chromosome, we have the most anterior genes and at the five prime end of the DNA, we have the most posterior genes. So just to put the Hox genes in context, uh, the Hox gene expression patterns produce rhombomere borders. There are other gene transcription factors that control themselves control the expression of Hox genes. And then there are other target genes for the Hox proteins that have rhombomere specific expression patterns. Uh, those include the F kinases and the efferins. And you may remember that we have discussed the F kinases and the efferins in the context of axonal pathfinding more of which we will discuss later today. OK. So question for class discussion. I've never asked this before, and so the answer is open. What is the selective advantage of having gene clusters that confer selectivity in neural development? I have not looked up the answer to this question, so let's have some ideas. And I don't even know if the answer exists. Any ideas? Yes, Matthew. Well, uh, so Matthew has put has suggested that if the genes are all transferred at the same time presumably from one organism which is arising as a species from another, having them all there uh, prevents one from being deleted. OK, OK, I like that very much. Any embroidery on that? Any further ideas? Well, wouldn't you say that having just one Hox gene does no good at all, or even two or three. So we need a number of genes to make a pattern. So we need a number of genes to make a pattern. And this, the most robust way for a nature, a number of genes for a pattern, uh, for instance, to make the eight rhombomeres, we need six or eight genes. And so the robust, most robust way for nature to do that is by transferring them all at once. So I think you were saying part of the idea, and I've simply completed the idea. Any other ideas? Okay, so let's let's take that one and use it next year for the course, or write a paper about it. Good. Uh, but we still have this question, number two, which is the selective advantage of collinearity in the Hox genes. What is the advantage that arranging them from three five to that they have the same order from three prime to five prime as the uh, body segments? I want you to realize that I don't know the answer. So give me the answer. Come on, you guys are could all warm toast with your brains. Give me the answer. <laughs> 
All right, well, if you think of it, email me. Okay, the next 10 slides or so, we're going to discuss growth cones and the molecules that bind them. So this is somewhere between Ralph Adolph's question. Okay, we got to the vicinity of the target. How do we refine our destination at the target? And how do we make the correct synapses? And so let's have some terminology here. The leading edge of a growth cone, of a growing axon is called the growth cone. And you've seen some wonderful pictures in Candell. It spreads out uh, and gets very thin. And uh, the growth cone has microtubules and extending into its base. I'll show you a picture of that. But it's lamellae and filopodia, the end of the growth cone, growth, growth cone, have only actin filaments, which are a lot daintier than microtubules. So a lamella is a double parallel membrane. So it's a thin extension that doesn't have much. And the filopodia is filip filamentous little feet. That's what filopodia means. Okay, so when a growth cone is moving rapidly uh, along a pathway, it has a narrow profile. But when make, it makes decisions at a junction, it radiates filopodia and becomes wider and more complex. And the adhesion molecules on the filopodia contact the substrate. Now, in an experiment in vitro, the substrate would be a culture dish. Um, in life, it's the surface of other cells. And that helps to nucleate actin polymerization. Then microtubules invade the region with a newly stable actin cytoskeletal, cell, cytoskeleton, moves the axonal shaft forward. There are, and I'm going to show you a diagram of this in a moment. So many cell surface molecules function in growth cone guidance. And many are conserved, which is really cool, between invertebrates and vertebrates, and among vertebrates and among invertebrates. Now, the context, and Ralph has emphasized this as well, the context of the cue given by a given molecule can either be guidance or a guidance receptor, and the result of this contact can be aversion or attraction depending on the context, very much the way a transmitter molecule can be either excitatory or inhibitory, depending on its receptor. So if you look in greater detail, uh, I've combined several versions of Candell to give you what I think is the clearest view. Um, so here is a growth cone. And the theme here is that there are several types of motors. We have a few microtubules invading the growth cone. And if we look uh, in greater detail, here is one of the microtubules. And the microtubule through the membrane of the growth cone has adapters that allow it to contact a substrate, either a culture dish or another cell. Uh, the microtubules, as you know, from by eight by nine, uh, ex can extend themselves, and this makes the growth cone a little longer. Uh, and then desical fusion adds membrane to the leading edge to the leading edge of the filopodium. After a while, the cytoplasm in the trailing edge of the filopodium contracts, and so we have a new growth cone, new axonal growth, which has moved the um, which has moved the growth cone forward. And this is helped by actin polymerization. So we have a couple of engines, motors. We have microtubules being polymerized and depolymerized, mostly polymerized here. We have, ax we have actin forming and being dissolved and moving forward. So a growth cone is a very complex machine, and it is constantly sampling the environment and making decisions about where to turn or where to avoid. Uh, so among the families involved here uh, are two of the most famous. There are, <clears throat> uh, they are generally called cell adhesion molecules, sometimes just CAMs or cell adhesion molecules. They have immunoglobulin domains or they have fibronectin repeats. 
They're all single-pass transmembrane proteins. So what we are looking here at here is cell number one and cell number two, and here the cell adhesion molecules are extending through the membrane. Some of the cell adhesion molecules, called cadherins, uh, mediate calcium-dependent adhesion. They also signal in various ways inside the cell and are attached in various ways to the actin cytoskeleton. So we shouldn't see a cell adhesion molecule as simply anchored in the membrane and, and allowing the cell to float around it. Actually, these molecules all get anchored to the cytoskeleton and in some places can influence the formation or breakdown of the cytoskeleton. For instance, here's a cyclic AMP signaling system. This is a guanylate um, kinase signaling system. So in terms of growth cone guidance, growth cones can respond to attractive guidance cues, that's green, by increased outgrowth or by turning toward the cue source. We've seen that. They mostly respond to repellent guidance cues by collapsing. The guidance cues can be diffusible, and we haven't seen those yet. There are examples in Candel and cell surface, and we've seen two examples of those. So uh, they're either proteins, again, they are single pass transmembrane receptors, or small molecules. And I will give you an example of that later in the talk as well. So growth cones can be guided by these various phenomena, and they are propelled then by their motors. Let's turn to this very interesting topic that Ralph also brought up, which is chemoaffinity. You remember that he discussed Roger Sperry's chemoaffinity hypothesis, which was derived from cutting optic nerves to the frog and watching the behavior of the frog. This, some of these experiments were also done in uh, goldfish in the optic tectum, which is the lower vertebrates equivalent of the superior colliculus. And so Sperry said whenever fibers were disconnected and transplanted or just scrambled, regrowth always led to orderly functional recovery. And so Sperry said it seemed a necessary conclusion from these results that the cells and fibers of the brain must carry a kind of individual identification tag. And Ralph has explained to you that the part of the story are the efferins and the F kinases, uh, which are basically not chemoaffinity, but chemorepulsion. And so this is a modification to the, um, to the Sperry hypothesis in which a gradient of molecules repel each other. And there are various experiments that Ralph told you about, about transplanting one region of the tectum to another and finding that the usual partner gets, um, avoids that region. And so all of these are phenomena associated with efferins, which are the peptid ligands, and the F kinases, which are the tyrosine kinase receptors. Well, what about the hunt for true chemoaffinity molecules, not repulsive molecules, but chemoaffinity molecules? These would, in principle, allow a much more selective pairing between cells. And so for this, we turn to the fly visual system and to Oops. Experiment done by Kai Zin's lab. In fact, these experiments are just going on. They will be published soon. Kai Zin is a Caltech professor, and he has collaborated with non-Caltech people. And he has solved the chemoaffinity problem. Uh, he has found a group of genes uh, uh, which were previously called the defective proboscis extension response, DPR. Well, you had to call them something. And you, you know from looking at the uh, 
spelling of the gene that this is an invertebrate, and in fact, this is Drosophila. So there are 21 DPR genes, and they interact with nine DPR interaction proteins. And since they're called DPR interaction proteins, they are labeled DIPs, or DIPs. You know, the problem is that you have to label, you have to name genes something, and so you sometimes just name them with what they uh, bind to. There are, addition, in addition, the DPR and the DIP complex interacts with a leucine-rich repeat um, called the C-DIP. Okay, so... Oh, I'm so sorry. So, the search for the chemo molecules in the fly visual system involves the retina of the fly, the lamina, which is a first stage below it, the medulla and the inner medulla. The molecules that Zinn and his collaborators have identified govern interactions among the cells, finding their postsynaptic partners in several of these layers. Uh, in detail, the interactions between these molecules, so this is a DPR molecule, and here is its binding partner, DIP. This is a particular DPR molecule, cleverly enough, called DPR6, and a particular DIP molecule, cleverly enough, called DIP-alpha. Um, they make a typical, a pattern that is similar in the nervous system and in other organs throughout the body among vertebrates and invertebrates. For instance, there are C. elegans synapses that have the tips of these two molecules interacting with, with each other. The function of the gene family in C. elegans has not been described the way it has in flies, but there certainly is a similar molecular interaction. And even in the immune system, molecules that, uh, neutrophils that contact other cells have a similar interaction. So, again, the DPR6 molecule in blue, the DIP alpha molecule in red, the two of them interacting with each other. So this is the chemo affinity part right here. This is the specific labels on one cell contacting another cell. The interface is, interestingly enough, almost all hydrophobic. The molecules have to fit together. They have various amino acids in one part and another part that allow them to fit together. And so this then becomes the chemo affinity mechanism, at least among fruit flies. Uh, moving on, so that's a rather nice story about Sperry's hypothesis, and it really is quite a breakthrough. Uh, and those slides were provided by Kai Zinn. Uh, in addition, there are other molecules involved in growth cones. There are the semaphorins and the netrins. The, again, they can mediate either attraction or repulsion. So this figure, which is like a figure from Candel, has a nice growth cone extending its phyllopods, sensing the environment. And here, uh, as a result of a semaphorin interaction, uh, this growth cone has retracted, and it's not going to go in this direction anymore. Again, the semaphorins and the net here, the semaphorins uh, are either attached to one of the cells by a single-pass transmembrane protein, or it can be cleaved from that single-pass membrane protein and diffuse highly locally and interact with the receptors, their heteromultimers, between a molecule called a neuropillin and a molecule called a plexin. And so the semaphorins interact with the receptors in ways that are not yet understood, uh, but do cause growth cone attraction or repulsion, either uh, efflorescence of the growth cone or um, 
the collapse of the growth code. So repulsion apparently involves actin depolymerization. The growth cone collapses. Attraction may involve the formation of new actin filaments as the growth cone extends. And there are a number of small molecule GTPases that seem to be involved in uh, making the actin depolymerize or grow. Uh, they are called rho GTPases. And we're going to talk about other G proteins, but the GTPases, uh, the small molecule GTPases, are different. So, simplified view would be that one of these small molecules, GTPases, rho favors collapse, and RAC favors growth, but that may be too simple. So, as usual, we have complex signal transduction systems. You won't be responsible for knowing these signal transduction systems, but as I write the development question for the midterm, I'd like you to be able to find an example of one or more of these. So, in addition, uh, let's go to the other topic of the nerve muscle synapse formation. Uh, you may remember that in previous lectures, we said that many uh, basic principles of chemical transmission were discovered at the nerve muscle synapse. And I might add, uh, that many basic principles of synaptic development were also discovered at the nerve muscle synapse. So here we have the motor neuron making the end plate or the nerve muscle synapse. And um, this is all a figure that you've seen before from Kandel. You've also seen from Kandel this highly organized figure of the presynaptic terminal, the glial cell, and the postsynaptic uh, folds. And so now one asks the question, how, do, how does all this arrive? And how does all this arise? And the answer is, as you know, in several steps. Uh, the growth cone reaches the muscle fiber. We've discussed how that occurs. Uh, it reforms to make a semi-flat contact with the muscle fiber. A hero of the story very much is the basal lamina that's different from the lamina we discussed in the Drosophila uh, retina, which is actually a group of cells. This is a kind of extracellular matrix, and it begins to form. Uh, receptors for acetylcholine then cluster under the forming synapse, the nascent synapse. The Schwann cell comes in and wraps the synapse. In the beginning, and this is going to be a common theme, uh, Several axons innervate the muscle, but later all but one withdraws. So at the mature synapse, we have the three cells, the motor neuron, the muscle cell, and the um, Schwann cell. Between these cells, we have the basal lamina, the postsynaptic membrane is infolded. The acetylcholine receptors are at the top of the folds, sodium channels at the bases, and acetylcholinesterase is in the basal lamina. We've said all of this before, um, acetylcholinesterase. I haven't told you that the sodium channels are at the bases of the folds, but they are. So how does all this occur? Acetylcholine receptors, which are normally not very well localized before the uh, nerve fiber arrives, become localized underneath the nerve fiber. Uh, there are several mechanisms. First of all, the nerve secretes signals that cluster pre-existing receptors at the synapse, and I'll tell you about that in subsequent slides. Also, the nucleus, uh, as you know, a muscle fiber uh, is a fusion of many cells with many nuclei. So this is a cell that has many nuclei. And there are signals that tell the nuclei near the synapse to make additional acetylcholine receptors. And also, uh, receptor expression gets turned off at the other nuclei. All of this is amplified in. Uh, by action potentials in the muscle fiber, which presumably occur only if the synapse is working. Uh, 
Uh, and the presumption in almost every case for activity dependent signaling in the nervous system is calcium influxes, either directly toward, uh, by the uh, receptor itself or produced by action potentials which activate calcium channels. So here we have the acetylcholine receptor transcription increases, uh, but away from the synapse it decreases. Um, excuse me, that phone call was from the person who installed an alarm in our house yesterday. And so I should tell him that I'll call him back. Um, now, I've mentioned the basal lamina, uh, which is a sheath of connective tissue, collagen-like tissue, extracellularly. A very interesting set of experiments that go back several decades is that if you cut the nerve, uh, it grows back to where it used to be. Um, but it only grow even if you destroy the muscle fiber and remove the muscle fiber. Now, that's pretty interesting. And it turns out that some of the attractive cues occur because while you have destroyed the muscle fiber, but you have kept the basal lamina intact. And so it is actually the basal lamina, a particular laminin variant that is enriched in the synaptic extracellular matrix that attracts the nerve back. How this all occurs uh, is not entirely clear, uh, but one of, the, uh, one of the signals secreted from the nerve is called agrin, uh, meaning aggregating protein. It activates a postsynaptic tyrosine kinase called musk, muscle-specific kinase, which in turn activates another molecule called rapsin. And the rapsin actually physically clusters the receptors in response to the nerve. So if we have a cultured muscle fiber with no agrin, it uh, has uniform um, acetylcholine receptor, uh, uniform acetylcholine receptor density, but if we add agrin, those uh, receptors cluster. So, rapsin is an abbreviation for receptor-associated protein at synapses. Again, you have to name these something. So, there are a few molecules then necessary for clustering acetylcholine receptors. And really, these clustered acetylcholine receptors and the development of the nerve muscle synapse is actually a lesson for the development of all synapses. So in a wild-type mouse, um, you have these wonderful plaques, end plates that are nicely compact along the nerve. In an agrin knockout, even though the main function of agrin is said to be postsynaptic, those axons spread out looking for other synapses. And does anybody here want an explanation of what a knockout mouse is? Okay, a knockout mouse, Ellen, is a mouse whose genome has been modified to interrupt a particular gene. So that gene has been knocked out. Uh, the mutants that we discussed earlier in this lecture, such as the, homeo, uh, the, home, the Hox gene mutants, are naturally occurring knockouts, typically. Sometimes those uh, knockouts are, are helped along by irradiating the parents so that there are more mutations caused. But in any case, those are, that's the way that one does forward genetics by knocking out genes. Now, in a mouse, 
it's a little more complicated. You need to do some fancy molecular biology to knock out a specific gene, but you can do it. And so if you want to get rid of the action of agrin, best way to do it is to knock out the agrin gene. This is done with base pairing and other ways to manipulate DNA. A musk knockout gene has a very similar phenotype. And the rapsin knockout has a bit more com compact exons, but still nothing like the wild type. And so we need the function of all three of these genes to have a nice, well-organized nerve muscle synapse. Any questions? Again, the phenotype uh, I've just showed you differs from the genotype which is the knockout of the gene. So the phenotype is the phenomenon associated with the genotype, the knockout of the gene. It is possible, as many of you know, to produce much more subtle changes in genes than simply eliminating them uh, entirely. You can make one more active. You can change its function, etc. But for today, we're just talking about elimin eliminating the gene product entirely. Yes, sir. So the question is, what is the difference between knockdown and knockout? Good. A knockdown experiment is typically done in the animal after birth, and it's a partial knockout. The way it's done is typically by injecting a RNA that base pairs with the RNA made by the animal. This causes a set of enzymes to come and destroy the endogenous RNA. So the knockdown experiment is easier to do because you don't have to work with uh, embryonic stem cells and with lots of mouse mutations, but it takes a lot of experimentation to get the right or knockdown simple hairpin RNA so that it does a good job of knocking down. A knockdown experiment is rarely complete, but usually informative enough to give a phenotype. Any other questions? There's another factor called acetylcholine receptor inducing activity, uh, which actually makes more acetylcholine receptors. It was first discovered and called ARIA, acetylcholine receptor inducing activity, discovered at the nerve muscle synapse, secreted by the nerve. It is a member of an extremely interesting family called the neuregulans. Neuregulin is a transmembrane protein, which is proteolized to release a growth factor. And um, it is really the founding member of the neuregulin family. Because this family has been implicated strongly in schizophrenia, we'll get to that later on when I talk about schizophrenia. Uh, EGF is epidermal growth factor. Now we come to the topic of synapse elimination. Um, during a baby's first two years of life, those 10 to the 11th synapses, uh, those 10 to the 11th neurons are getting an average of 1,000 um, synapses apiece, 10 to the 14th, divided by the number of seconds in two years. Come, you get to the conclusion that you get about a million synapses forming per second actually more than that form because many are eliminated. And so, uh, as we said a few minutes ago, uh, growth cones uh, typically get directions not to innervate specific muscle fibers, but only a group of fibers. So this is called polysynaptic innervation. It typically dis disappears soon after birth, uh, and it is a competitive process the neuron that's best able to drive the muscle wins out to become the sole neuron. Uh, 
So each neuron then commits its resources to a group of fibers and it abandons the others it had initially innervated. And you can bias this with various chemical and activities. So obviously this is an extremely interesting phenomenon. And one of the hypotheses, one of the mechanisms of synapse elimination is called the limiting neurotrophic factor hypothesis. Uh, here, not at the muscle, but in a peripheral ganglion, one gets the same kind of thing. More neurons appear than are required to innervate the target cells. And there is a hypothesis that the target cell has a limited supply of a neurotrophic factor, that is a factor that allows neurons to form. And as Ralph told you uh, during lecture three, one of those neurotrophic factors is um, nerve growth factor NGF. Uh, the neurotrophin uh, then acts, uh, there are several examples of neurotrophin. NGF is one of them. Another one is called, appropriately enough, neurotrophin number three. Uh, another one is called BDNF. That's mostly in the brain. Another one's called glial de uh, derived neurotrophic factor. Uh, they, distinct subtypes of neurons then depend on different neurotrophic factors. There are uh, four major ones. Uh, actually, there are many major ones and they are listed here. Fibroblast, fibroblast growth factor, glial derived neurotrophic factor, number three, uh, and um, NGF. Ralph showed you this slide, which is the tyrosine receptor kinase class of receptors for neurotrophins. We've named a couple of these neurotrophins here. Uh, they are uh, four, uh, they are, there are four of them recognized by three TRKs, tyrosine receptor subtypes. Uh, they're actually less specific, specific than one would like. There is some crosstalk between them. So neurotrophins regulate neuronal survival. They regulate proliferation of precursors, differentiation, growth, branching, transmitter synthesis, synaptic efficacy, and rearrangement. And uh, BDNF is one that is particularly interesting to neuroscientists these days uh, because it may, in fact, be a pretty good antidepressant. But when there is, uh, by acting on track B, tyrosine receptor kinase B, but also too much BDNF causes epilepsy. So again, the context in which a growth factor, a neurotrophin acts, is important, and the time that it acts is also important. So BDNF brain-derived neurotrophic. So track signaling pathways are rather complex. Uh, they all involve tyrosine phosphorylations. That's why they're called TRK. Here's the plasma membrane. Ultimately, many uh, neurotrophin pathways lead to the activation of transcription factors by phosphorylating them and to the activation of target genes. Now, that's pretty interesting because in addition, other growth factors instruct cells to continue in the cell cycle. So we have growth factors that tell a cell to continue in the growth in the cell cycle by activating genes associated with proliferation and with division of neurons. And so uh, this can turn in, and of course, this is the basis for which some uh, track genes are all oncogenes because they continue to tell a cell to participate in the cell cycle and cells to pro proliferate even when they should not. So some uh, growth factor receptors are indeed oncogenes. They can cause cancer. We also should mention notch signaling. And I'll briefly say that notch and delta signaling occur because the notch and delta um, partners in a cell uh, 
They are polarized, but all cells in a region may express both notch and delta. However, the ones in the middle of the region seem to express slightly more delta and slightly less notch, and so a signaling imbalance occurs. And the neat thing about notch and delta is that they reinforce each other so that uh, notch decreases the uh, activation of delta, and as a result, one gets a sharpening of a boundary. Uh, so one can now sharpen a boundary in another way. We have the F and the efferins, the F, the efferins and the efferin kinases. We have this wonderful set of cell adhesion molecules, and then we have boundaries which are sharpened by lateral inhibition. Uh, and Michael Elowitz at Caltech, with his mastery of transcription factors, mastery of gene activation, and of differences between cells, is making nice contributions to this pathway, even though he does not consider himself a neuroscientist. Um, two more points. First, there's a famous example discovered by Paul Patterson here at Caltech in which you can actually change the phenotype of a cell, that is, whether it's cholinergic or adrenergic, uh, depending on um, the target. The target secretes neurotrophic factors. For instance, the most famous example is the sweat gland. And the sweat gland um, is, at first, during development, is adrenergic. The, uh, sorry, the neuron that innervates it is adrenergic. But based on the neurotrophic factors that it releases, uh, the sweat gland induces the cell to become cholinergic to release acetylcholine. And the result is that acetylcholine becomes the major transmitter activating the sweat glands. So this switch takes place after birth after the cell has reached, the neuron has reached the target and has innervated the target. One final complication in developmental neuroscience, and I promise that this is the final complication, at least for today, is that cells can actually change whether they are, exci whether they are excited or inhibited by GABA. We usually think of GABA as an inhibitory transmitter, that depends on having a high internal chloride concentration. The internal chloride concentration is governed by pumps. A cell starts out, in many cases, with a low chloride concentration. Sorry, just the reverse. It starts out with a high internal chloride concentration. That means that the chloride in the cell intracellular is equal to the extracellular chloride. As a result, the Nernst potential for chloride is near zero, so that early in life, in many cases, GABA actually produces depolarizations and activates cells. And then when the full complement of pumps for chloride and bicarbonate get established in a cell, the intracellular concentration of chloride dr drops, the chloride gets pumped out by transporters, as a result, we have more chloride outside than inside. Uh, the same is true for sodium, but the sign of chloride differs from that of sodium. As a result, the Nernst potential for chloride is actually quite negative. And so chloride becomes a uh, GABA, which activates chloride channels, becomes a hyperpolarizing or inhibitory transmitter. And the result is that we have a switch from excitatory actions of GABA to inhibitory actions of GABA. This is thought to be important in whether early on in life a cell gets activity-dependent signals that help it to develop normally. So again, these are all examples that I'd like you to look at in Candel, but you won't be responsible for regurgitating many examples uh, uh, for each point. And I will have my office hours as usual outside the red door today. See you Wednesday.